Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. Alright gang, previously we saw how carriers in an intrinsic semiconductor are excited into the conduction band through exposure to either heat or light. Today, our goal is to develop an understanding of how such a material will behave in an electric field. Wait, didn't we do this a long time ago for a free electron? In that video, we showed that an electron in an E field will feel a force on it that shifts it by dk, and thus accelerates it in the field. Good point, and we'll find a lot of that carries over here. However, the electron dispersion in a semiconductor is pretty different than the free electron dispersion. Let's build up F equals ma for a semiconductor. We already have an expression for dk dt from an external E field. Yeah, we do, and that's exactly this force business. So now we have an expression that relates acceleration and force. Whoa, sounds like there should be a mass involved somewhere too. Yeah, so we can define this term as our effective mass. It's not a real mass, but it's a descriptor of how the electron group velocity changes in an electric field. Seems funny that we're writing 1 over m star, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just a convention. Since we've treated k as our independent variable, people typically like to see it on the bottom of the derivative. So nothing special, just a little easier on the eyes. Ah, okay. So let's go back to the free electron model for a moment. Does this approach give us that the effective mass is the rest mass of the electron? I think I'd feel better about this if it did. Yeah, we do. In that case, our dispersion relationship was the following. Then when we calculate the second derivative, we just get me. But give us a minute and we'll do some simplifying. Seems like the effective mass is then a parameter that varies depending on which k-point in the band that you're at. It does. Okay, let's see what we can do with this effective mass parameter. So when we're dealing with semiconductors, what well, part of the conduction band is full? Just the very bottom. Electrons get excited across the gap, into the bottom of the conduction band. Cool. And while the whole band is definitely not a parabola, we could probably fit one to the bottom part of the band where there are electrons. Like this. And since it's a parabola, the effective mass will be constant in this parabolic regime. Maybe an example would help see this. Let's take Galli Marstein as an example. The conduction band rises sharply, so the change in velocity with time is high for an electron. Yeah, starting from the conduction band edge, the group velocity is zero. With just a small amount of time in an E field, the electron has an incredibly high group velocity. So the electrons would behave as if they were particles of low mass in the electric field. Exactly. If we fit a parabola to the band edge of Galli Marcinide, we get an effective mass of about 0.06 times the mass of the electron. That's crazy low. It sure is. And it kind of begs the question, how can it be true? Yeah, I think to understand this, I have to come back to this whole wave-particle duality. Because we're not talking about a physical electron moving, right? Instead, we're talking about the group velocity of a wave moving. And for me, that, that feels a little better. Yeah, it feels better for me too. Okay, so we can parameterize the conduction band electrons in terms of a mass. But can we bring this back to conductivity? Yeah. Remember we developed the expression for conductivity for the free parabolic electron. We found that conductivity equals the number of free electrons times their charge and effective mass divided by the relaxation time between collisions. Wait, you're just going to swap out the rest mass with the effective mass, aren't you? Sure am. Go check the original derivation if it surprises you that I can do it. Wow, I would have guessed that the square wall potential would prove useful in the conductivity of intrinsic semiconductors. They're just so different. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, right? It is. Okay, so we've dealt with the conduction band, but I'm going to suspect we can't ignore the valence band since it's not completely full. Okay, so let's start with the effective mass of electrons in the valence band. So we'll still assume a parabola, except this one is pointed downward, so the double derivative will be negative. So Eric, what do you think a negative effective mass means? Yeah, this seems extra creepy. 
because now the negative mass means that the E field shifts the electrons like this. So the electrons have a net momentum, dk, parallel to the external E field, whereas in the conduction band, their momentum was anti-parallel. Or you could view this as the whole bubble acts like it has positive charge and moves in the direction you would expect, given the applied E field. So in practice, physicists prefer to think about imaginary particles with positive mass and positive charge, rather than electrons with negative mass and negative charge. Both are pretty unsettling. Bringing it all together, it looks like the valence band contributes to conduction just as much as the conduction band. So it's sort of a misnomer. Looking at the whole big picture, it seems like semiconductors are really going to be a bit tricky. But, you know, for me, this is one of the reasons solid state is very rich. You get behavior that is totally non-intuitive, but you can still rationalize it using simple models. Okay, let's wrap this up. In short, we looked at how an electron responds to an electric field and described this response using an effective mass. And a critical part of that was invoking that the band edge is parabolic within the occupied region. That way, we could simply invoke a single effective mass value and use our old expressions for conductivity. Then everything got wacky when we went to the valence band edge. The negative effective mass of electrons near the band edge yield the opposite behavior in an electric field than we might classically expect. And of course, no podcast is complete without some questions for you to consider at home. Take it away, Eric. First off, Nicole and I talked about how the effective mass is related to band concavity. Compare and contrast the shape of bands with a heavy and a light effective mass. Second, when we worked with the weak potential, we saw that increasing our Fourier coefficients resulted in band gaps at the Brillouin zone edge. Say we start cranking up our Fourier coefficients. What do you suppose will happen to the effective mass of the conduction and valence bands? And finally, consider a 2D intrinsic semiconductor with a square lattice. Sketch the case space for the conduction and valence bands at some finite t. Then apply an E-field pointing to the left and describe how these states shift over time. So this wraps up our discussion on electrical conductivity in intrinsic semiconductors. In the next video, Eric and I will develop an expression for the carrier concentration in intrinsic semiconductors. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.